Middle Way Philosophy, Video 1B, The Middle Way and Christianity, by Robert M. Ellis. This is a tributary video to video number one, which you are advised to watch first. As explained in some of the other videos in this series, the Middle Way is a principle of judgment, avoiding both positive and negative absolutes on either side. What can the Middle Way then have to do with Christianity? Many people wrongly assume that Christianity is necessarily about having absolute beliefs. To understand how we could think otherwise about Christianity, we need to understand the distinction between having beliefs about God and having a meaning of God. Beliefs about God, like beliefs about anything else, are what we assume to be the case. It's very difficult to know what might be the case or not the case about God. But the meaning of God can nevertheless be extremely important to us, even if we have no particular beliefs. It's not essential to have beliefs about something in order to have a strong sense of its meaning. Think about the last film you got utterly absorbed in, or the last novel that really moved you. To understand this, it's helpful to think in terms of the role of the two hemispheres of the brain. Belief in God is held in the left hemisphere, and that is entirely self-sufficient, self-reinforcing, a purely abstract set of representations about God. Experience of God, on the other hand, whatever that is and wherever it comes from, is fed into the right hemisphere, and the meaning of God consists of the way in which those experiences of God create associations in our brains in relation to our physical experience of God. God must be perfect and absolute, whereas human beings are imperfect, experiential and responsible for their conduct. The version of Christianity, which has become dominant for many centuries, involves revelation coming from a perfect God to an imperfect human being, via scripture, by experience, by natural law or any other means. Such revelation is unacceptable in terms of the middle way. Imagine if the revelation was perfect, how could an imperfect being possibly understand it? If on the other hand, revelation was imperfect, how could it be divine? How could it genuinely represent the will of a perfect being? In Christian terms, revelation and the belief in revelation is blasphemous. It simply doesn't take into account the holiness and difference of God. It anthropomorphizes God, turns him into something like humans. Rather than thinking about God solely in terms of perfect information, which the left hemisphere somehow gets from nowhere, Let's think about things the other way around, in terms of the imperfect experience of human beings. Human beings can reach out to God by experiencing God. How can they do that? Well, they can experience God as an archetypal meaning. That is, an experience of their own potential, of their own completely integrated or ultimate state. They could also take charge of the interpretation of what God is to them. God is, after all, a human experience. They can therefore also take responsibility, which is a crucial aspect of any kind of morality which is associated with God. If morality is just a set of commands handed down from on high, then we are simply left with a binary choice to obey or disobey. No responsibility is involved, only power. This way round, responsibility becomes possible. Such an approach is not wholly foreign to the Christian tradition, but can be found amongst the Christian mystics. For example, Hildegard of Bingen, or Meister Eckhart, or Julian of Norwich. There's also a Protestant mystical tradition to be found, for example, in the Quakers. These strands of Christianity have always prized experience well above doctrine even if sometimes they have towed the line to hold the peace. Experience has actually in practice been much more important to them. A God who is recognised to arise 
within the human psyche, rather than from some supernatural cause outside it, is not in the slightest way less powerful or imposing or important. If you doubt that, have a look at Jung's Red Book, where throughout Jung recognises the psychological nature of the experiences he's having, but it doesn't in the least reduce the extreme power of those experiences over him. In some ways, you could see the arising of Christianity itself as a response to the difficulties in relating to an idea that is absolute, that is, of a perfect God. How can human beings, for example, obey the commands of a perfect God? What does a perfect God, in fact, have to do with us? Christianity resolves that problem with Christ. Christ, who, according to the Nicene Creed, is both wholly human and, at the same time, wholly divine. Of course, something that's completely impossible in terms of left brain logic. You could try and resolve that metaphysically, which is probably not at all useful, or you can understand it in psychological terms. That is, that we can keep God meaningful by recognising God to be, in some senses, human. So we can have a meaningful sense of the absolute God, but at the same time, when it comes to beliefs that we can actually relate to, those beliefs have to be at human level. Regardless of its historical significance, the crucifixion can represent an event in every one of us. That is, the free embrace of imperfection, the recognition that we are embodied and that we suffer and that we encounter problems and that we don't live up to the ideals we set ourselves, those ideals corresponding to the perfect God. By freely embracing that imperfection, we can gain atonement or at one which, of course, is reminiscent of integration, an important part of middle way philosophy. The resurrection then symbolically reminds us of the unexpected new life that arises from that integration of the imperfect, from that atonement which arises from that ultimate sacrifice, as it seems that completely unexpected new turn of events which comes from new integration. The negative feedback loop is the basic way by which all humans learn and adapt in a whole range of situations. They have a belief, explicit or implicit, they try it out, they meet a problem, and because of meeting that problem, they have to adjust their belief. Now relate that to the Christian cycle we've just been discussing. There's a divine demand which seems too difficult to live up to when the human practice follows it. That leads to a recognition of human limitations which is symbolised most painfully by the crucifixion. However, that recognition leads to new life, to the adjustment of the theory, which can only happen because of the problem, of the recognition of the problem. That new life, of course, brings with it new expectations, which are also difficult to learn up to. Nevertheless, a process of integration has taken place. Christian ethics, then, should not be about appealing to revealed rules which are taken to be absolute, but are actually the result of our own interpretation. Instead, taking responsibility for our own actions we need to face up to our finiteness and our uncertainty, the human state in comparison to God. Used wisely, the crucifixion and the resurrection can act as symbols of that basic ethic. Christianity is an extremely diverse tradition with many different kinds of manifestations, and different cultures, different situations, based on different kinds of beliefs and different kinds of examples. For those of Christian heritage particularly, it's our task to take responsibility for selecting from that heritage and making wise use of it, recognising that that is a human responsibility. There is no essential Christianity. We decide we are responsible for what Christianity should be. If it's to be a wise and helpful Christianity, then it needs to be a Christian middle way. 
So, to summarise, the middle way can be found in Christianity, even if less explicitly than, say, in the story of the Buddha in Buddhism. An agnostic form of Christianity is one that avoids absolute beliefs about God, neither affirming nor denying that God exists, but instead focuses on experience of God, which can nevertheless be extremely powerful. There's plenty of precedent for that kind of approach to Christianity in the mystical tradition. The meaning of God loses none of its power, given that that power is basically experiential even if we let go of beliefs about a perfect abstract God. Belief in revelation can indeed be seen as blasphemous given that we are imperfect and have no understanding of the perfect and absolute. Christ symbolises the integration of the meaning of God and humanity. And in that way, Christianity among the theistic religions can make a distinctive contribution Christian ethics, too, should start with a recognition of human uncertainty rather than the belief that we know God's wishes.